Hello, everyone. In this lecture podcast, we will look at federal state relations. This is a crucial topic because it's actually a source of much of the cases that end up in the high court, mainly because it involves the tension or the struggle between the Commonwealth and uh, the states concerning uh, legislative powers. And that is the focus of our lecture podcast. We will recall that uh, we had talked previously about the, the tension among the three branches of government. So the tension among the executive as opposed to the legislature, as opposed to the judiciary. So those are the three institutions. And if you look at them as actors, you will see therefore the struggle, the drama among those three branches of government. And the other drama, if we consider that, in the context of uh, Australian politics and uh, governments, they would relate to the drama and the struggle and the tension between the Commonwealth and the states in relation to their ability to legislate or their ability to enact laws. The third drama that you will later on see would relate to the tension between um, the powers of the state to pass laws as opposed to the rights of its citizens. So that will be the third uh, and final topic that we will be discussing in our course in constitutional law. But for the, for the purpose of this lecture podcast, our focus will be to examine that drama, that struggle, the tension between uh, the Commonwealth Parliament versus uh, the state parliament. So after studying this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain the scope and limits of Commonwealth and state legislative powers and the subject matters over which they can legislate exclusively and concurrently. Should also then be able to discuss and explain the conflicts in and resolution of Commonwealth and state parliamentary relations should then also be able to discuss and explain the expansionary doctrine in the engineer's case and the constraints of Commonwealth legislative power in interfering with state governmental powers. And finally, you should be able to cite and discuss key judicial decisions that elucidate the Commonwealth state legislative relations. So let's begin by talking about the distribution of legislative powers. We might say that there are at least two types or two systems of government. One would be federal systems of government and the other one would be unitary. Let's speak first of the unitary systems of government. In a unitary system of government, what this refers to is that power is located in just one uh, single institution or body. So if you speak, for example, of uh, New Zealand, it has a unitary system of government because all power uh, is, is just uh, located in the uh, New Zealand parliament. There are no states in New Zealand, so there is no tension between... Uh, there might be other powers, for example, if you look at cities, but they are considered subordinate and even creations of the New Zealand parliament, so there is no struggle there. It's, it's just one unitary system of government, and that's the New Zealand government. Uh, in the Philippines, for example, it also has a, a unitary system of government, so that uh, as far as the legislature is concerned, although it has a Senate and a House of Representatives, it is these institutions which wield the legislative powers of uh, the nation state itself. If you speak of a federal system of government, there is a tension because there are actually two opposing, I don't know if the correct word is opposing, but there are at least two institutions that wield legislative power. On the one hand, you have the Federation or the Commonwealth, uh, the Commonwealth government or the Commonwealth or federal parliament. And the, on, the, on the other hand, you have the state parliaments. And in, in that case, there will always be the question of 
as far as the ability to, or the power to or the competence to legislate on certain subjects are concerned, who wields the power to legislate on a specific subject matter? And uh, as far as Australia is concerned, we have a federal system of government, and the same is true with the United States of America, where you have the, uh, the Senate and the House of Representatives uh, of the United States uh, wielding the, uh, the, uh, the federal powers, the federal legislative powers of the United States government. And uh, in contrast uh, to that, you also have the states which wield uh, their own respective legislative powers. But our focus uh, in this lecture podcast will be to look at the context of uh, federal versus state legislative powers in the context of Australia. We might say that as far as the distribution of legislative powers are concerned, so remember our focus here would be legislative powers. There are four ways by which power would be distributed. One is that there are powers which belong exclusively to the Commonwealth Parliament. The other one would be uh, powers which belong exclusively to the states, and that would be number three in the uh, figure that I'm showing in this, in this slide. The third in the middle, which is represented as number two, that would be those uh, set of legislative powers that both belong to the Commonwealth Parliament as well as the state parliaments. In other words, these are concurrent legislative powers or they, these are shared legislative powers. And in that case, therefore, it is in this area that there could be a, uh, a lot of conflict as well. And finally, the one about number four, this is an area where neither the Commonwealth Parliament nor the state parliaments have any power to legislate on that subject. And this would typically uh, involve, for example, uh, certain rights and freedoms that are impliedly protected by the Constitution, such as the implied freedom of uh, political communication. And we will discuss that later on in, uh, in this lecture podcast. Let's begin by talking about uh, the exclusive powers of the Commonwealth. So, for example, uh, Section 52 of the Australian Constitution provides uh, some of the exclusive powers of the Commonwealth. And these would relate to the seat of the government of the Commonwealth and all places acquired by the Commonwealth for public purposes, uh, matters relating to any department of the public service, the control of which is by this constitution trans transferred to the executive government of the Commonwealth, uh, that subject is also uh, exclusive, exclusively a power that belongs to the Commonwealth Parliament. And other matters which are declared by the constitution to be within the exclusive power of the Parliament also uh, would be part of uh, the exclusive powers of the Commonwealth. And, uh, and one of those would, for example, be the exclusive power of the Commonwealth Parliament over customs, excise, and uh, duties as provided in uh, Section 90 of the Australian Constitution. So in particular, for example, Section 90 provides that uh, the Australian Common Commonwealth Parliament has the power to impose duties of customs and of excise and to grant bounties on the production or export of goods. And that this is a power that is exclusive to the uh, Australian Commonwealth Parliament. The Constitution also provides that states may not raise uh, their own uh, forces or armed forces and which means, therefore, that as far as the maintenance of an armed forces is concerned, that is a power that exclusively belongs to the Australian uh, Commonwealth Parliament. So the power to 
raise or maintain any, any, any naval or military force uh, belongs to the uh, Australian Commonwealth Parliament, as well as the power to impose any tax on property of any kind belonging to the Commonwealth uh, also belongs exclusively to the uh, Commonwealth Parliament. Uh, Section 115 of the Australian Constitution also provides that states may not coin money, nor may they make anything but gold and silver coin uh, as illegal tender in payment of debts. Now, the other set of powers, but continuing uh, on the discussion of um, uh, Commonwealth exclusive powers. So on the one hand, the one we discussed earlier related to the uh, exclusive powers of the Commonwealth, which are expressly stated uh, by the Constitution to belong exclusively to the uh, Commonwealth Parliament. But there are in fact other subjects that by necessary implication can only belong to the Commonwealth Parliament as an exclusive uh, power and these, for example, relate to the uh, ability to borrow money on the public credit of the Commonwealth. And because it is on the public credit of the Commonwealth, necessarily you would have to assume that that is a subject over which only the Commonwealth Parliament has the exclusive power to legislate on. As well, under uh, Section 51, Subsection 25 of the Constitution, it is also the, uh, within the exclusive power of the Australian uh, Commonwealth Parliament to recognize throughout the Commonwealth of the laws, the public acts and records, and the judicial proceedings of the states. Under subsection 31 of the Australian, uh, section 51 of the Australian Constitution, it is also by necessary implication a subject that belongs exclusively to the uh, Australian Commonwealth Parliament if it relates to the relations of the Commonwealth with the islands of the Pacific. It is also within the exclusive power of the uh, Commonwealth Parliament to acquire property on just terms from any state or person for any purpose in respect of which the power, the Parliament has power to make laws. The Australian Commonwealth Parliament also, by necessary implication, has the exclusive power to acquire, with the consent of a state, any railway of the state on terms arranged between the Commonwealth and the state. The Australian Commonwealth Parliament also has exclusive power in, re in, re in respect of matters of which this constitution makes provision until the Parliament otherwise provides. The Australian Commonwealth Parliament also has exclusive legislative power over matters referred to the Parliament of the Commonwealth by the Parliament or Parliaments of any state or states, but so that the law shall extend only to those states by whose parliaments the matter is referred or which afterwards adopt the law. Now that is a critical provision because what it means is that even if, as we will see later on, a particular subject or a particular matter belongs exclusively to the states, it is permissible under section 51, subsection 38 of the Australian constitution, it is permissible for the parliament or parliaments of any state to refer a particular matter which should have exclusively re, uh, belonged to the state parliament, it is within their power to, to refer that to the parliament of the commonwealth, in which case the parliament of the commonwealth would then have the power to legislate in that particular matter. It is also within the exclusive uh, power of the Commonwealth Parliament to legislate on the exercise within the Commonwealth at the request or with the concurrence of the parliaments of all the states directly concerned of any power which can at the establishment of this constitution be exercised only by the Parliament of the United Kingdom or the Federal Council of Australia. And finally, it is within the exclusive 
power of the Australian Commonwealth to legislate on matters which are incidental to the execution of any power vested by this constitution in the parliament or in either house thereof or in the government of a commonwealth or in the federal judicature or in any department or officer of the commonwealth. Now moving on, uh, it is important to emphasize that as far as uh, the, the legislative powers of the Commonwealth Part or the Australian Commonwealth Parliament are concerned. The Australian Commonwealth Parliament only has those powers which have been granted to it by the Constitution expressly or impliedly. So let me repeat that. As far as the Australian Commonwealth Parliament is concerned, its legislative powers are limited to, that, to those which are provided either expressly or impliedly by the Australian Commonwealth Constitution. So there is no other power, legislative power, that the Australian Commonwealth Parliament can, can uh, exercise except those which have been provided or granted by the Australian Commonwealth Constitution expressly or impliedly. This is important because it is different in the context of state parliaments because state parliaments uh, actually have supreme and plenary power to legislate on any subject, even those which are not expressly provide, provided or, or impliedly provided in the constitution. So the Australian state parliaments do not require uh, the, the Australian Commonwealth Constitution for them to be able to legislate on a subject. The assumption being that the uh, Australian uh, states are meant to have the, the same powers as imperial, the imperial UK government prior to federation. And the only time that the powers of the Australian states have been limited or circumscribed would be when they relinquished some of their legislative powers in favor of the Australian Commonwealth Parliament. So in other words, even had there been no federation, in other words, had there been no Australian Commonwealth constitutions, states would have had the supreme power and even the plenary and absolute power to legislate on any subject for as long as it was within their uh, sphere of uh, uh, territorial jurisdiction or within their geographic limits. So let me repeat that. As far as state parliaments are concerned, they did not require the Australian Constitution to vest in them the power to legislate on any subject. They had full and plenary and supreme and absolute power to legislate on any field for as long as their legislation mainly focused on uh, matters or objects or subjects within uh, their territorial limits or territorial jurisdiction. And there was no need for uh, any vesting by the constitution of any power on the state parliaments. In fact, as a consequence of the Federation, the state parliaments had to surrender or relinquish some of their state power, legislative powers in favor of the Australian Commonwealth Parliament. So that is the distinction there because, let me repeat, as far as the Australian Commonwealth Parliament is concerned, its powers are necessarily limited by what has been vested or provided or granted to it by the Australian Commonwealth Constitution, either expressly or impliedly, whereas as far as state parliaments are concerned, they do not require or they did not require the Australian Constitution to vest in them the power to legislate on any subject. In fact, as a result of the Federation or as a result of the Australian Commonwealth uh, Constitution, the state parliaments had to surrender and relinquish some of their uh, legislative powers. Now, so in other words, as, uh, the bulk of the powers of the Australian Commonwealth Parliament uh, 
come from Section 51, and we already discussed that briefly uh, as far as what the powers of the Australian um, Commonwealth Parliament are. And um, so these are some of the exclusive powers. But under Section 51, there are also a lot of other uh, matters over which the Australian Commonwealth Parliament can legislate on. But these, these, uh, these uh, matters over which the Australian Commonwealth Parliament can legislate on are actually matters which are shared by the Australian Commonwealth Parliament with state parliaments. So, for example, the power of taxation under uh, Section 51, subsection 2, that power, the power to tax, for example, is a power that is shared both by the Australian Commonwealth Parliament as well as the state parliaments. Um, the, the power, for example, to uh, legislate on postal, telegraphic, telephonic, and other like services Again, this is a subject uh, over which the Australian Commonwealth Parliament and the state parliaments can legislate on. So as far, therefore, as Section 51 is concerned, unless by necessary implication, as I mentioned earlier, and you can see that on the screen, so unless by necessary implication you can understand that uh, that specific or those specific uh, matters can only be legislated on by uh, the Commonwealth Parliament because of, the na of their nature as belonging exclusively to the Australian Commonwealth Parliament. All in all the other uh, heads of power or all the other subjects under Section 51, they are, ex they are concurrently shared by the Australian uh, Commonwealth Parliament and the state parliaments. Now, however, the rule is that although the Australian Commonwealth Parliament and the uh, state parliaments can concurrently legislate over the same field under, under Section 51 of the Australian Constitution, the moment that the Commonwealth Parliament legislates over the same field or over the same subject, and it is understood that the Commonwealth Parliament intended to cover that field completely or comprehensively to the exclusion of state, of state parliaments, then in that case, the state parliaments may no longer legislate on that same field or subject. So let me repeat that. While under Section 51, it is the most of the subjects or fields under, subsec under Section 51 of the Australian Constitution are shared concurrently by the Australian Commonwealth Parliament and the state parliaments, the moment that the Commonwealth Parliament legislates over a specific field or subject and the Commonwealth Parliament evinces an intention to cover that field completely or comprehensively to the exclusion of states, then states would then be uh, circumscribed or barred or proscribed from legislating on the same field or subject. Now, it would still be possible actually for the uh, state parliaments to legislate on the same field or the same subject that the Commonwealth Parliament has legislated on for as long as the Commonwealth Parliament has not uh, expressed its intention, clear intention in the legislation for their, uh, for their legislation or enactment to cover the field comprehensively and exclusively as opposed to state parliaments. So it's actually possible, it's actually possible for both the Commonwealth Parliament and state parliament to legislate on exactly the same field for as long as the Commonwealth Parliament has not shown or evinced an intention to cover that field comprehensively uh, to the exclusion of state law. And that is according to the doctrine uh, as enunciated in Ex parte McLean. And uh, Justice Dixon in Victoria versus the Commonwealth said, 
if it appears from the terms, the nature, or the subject matter of a federal enactment that it was intended as a complete statement of the law governing a particular matter or set of rights and duties, then for a state law to regulate or apply to the same matter or relation is regarded as a detraction from the full operation of the Commonwealth law and so as inconsistent. Now, the other point that uh, we need to remember is that what happens if the law that is passed by states, assume because they are, because both, as we, as we said earlier, both the uh, Commonwealth Parliament and the state parliaments can legislate on the same subject matter. What if they legislate in the same field, but there is an inconsistency? The rule is that when a law of the state is inconsistent with a law of the Commonwealth, it shall be the law of the Commonwealth that shall prevail. And the law of the state, to the extent of the inconsistency, shall be declared invalid. So, as I pointed out earlier, as far as uh, the state parliaments are concerned, they did not require the uh, Australian Commonwealth Constitution to be there for them to have uh, certain legislative powers. And so, therefore, as I said, the state parliaments, in fact, had to relinquish or concede some of their legislative powers to the Australian Commonwealth Parliament at the time of federation. So the understanding is those powers which have not been relinquished by the state parliaments to the Australian Commonwealth Constitution must necessarily therefore belong to them. So if we follow the ruling of the High Court in Melbourne versus Commonwealth or the state banking case, the understanding is that the remaining powers, unless disallowed by the Constitution, belong to state parliament. So uh, to, to, to summarize this specific point, the Australian Commonwealth Parliament can only legislate on those fields or subjects which are expressly or necessarily by implication uh, granted to it by the Australian Constitution and the remaining powers must belong perforce to state parliaments. As described by Justice Rich, in that same case, uh, he described uh, state legislative powers as the states within the limits of their own constitutions, retaining exclusive powers in the field, which remains after all the Commonwealth powers have been exercised to the full extent of their widest scope. So imagine that, uh, uh, imagine a situation where you have the entirety of all legislative powers, okay, within Australia. If you deduct from the entirety of, of legislative powers, the powers of the Australian Commonwealth Parliament, the remainder would be, legislative, would be, would be legislative powers that belong exclusively to the uh, Australian states. Uh, in addition, Unlike the uh, Commonwealth Parliament, whose legislative power is limited to making laws for the peace, order, and uh, good government of the Commonwealth, the state legislatures have general and broader legislative power within their constitutions, providing for their power to make laws relating for, uh, to peace, welfare, and good government of the states. So we must remember that these state, these state legislative powers were retained under uh, sections 106 and uh, 107 of the Australian Constitution. So the, the, the key distinction there is that in relation to the Commonwealth Parliament, the Commonwealth Parliament is limited to making laws for the peace, order, and good government. It is peace, order, and good government. Or, in other words, it is not for the Commonwealth Parliament to legislate on uh, fields involving welfare. So those which involve welfare 
would typically belong to, to states. And uh, the notion of welfare, therefore, is broader and more encompassing. The idea being that states have the primary responsibility to take care of uh, the people who live or the citizens who live within the state. So it is the responsibility of the state to take care of the welfare of the citizens living within the state. And for that matter, it is uh, within the power of the state, therefore, to legislate exclusively on, um, on the fields that relate to the welfare of the state. Whereas that of the Commonwealth Parliament is limited to peace, order, and good government of the Commonwealth. So if you, if you examine that, peace, order, and good government would, would focus on kind of holding uh, the Commonwealth together, ensuring that there is peace, ensuring that there is order, and there is good government. Whereas, so it, whereas the state parliaments focus on not just peace and good government, they focus on the welfare of the people within the state. But as previously pointed out, um, under Section 51, subsection 37 of the Australian Constitution, it is permissible for a state parliament to relinquish its, its exclusive power to legislate over a, set, a certain subject matter in favor of the Commonwealth Parliament. And this is the reason why uh, it is, you will now see that much of the legislation concerning welfare matters uh, are actually based on laws that have been passed by the Australian Commonwealth Parliament. And that is because in, 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 in those instances, the state parliaments relinquished their power to legislate in relation to, um, to uh, certain welfare matters. Now, it should also be pointed out that uh, under section, subsection 20, 3A of the Australian Constitution, and this is based on an amendment to the Australian Constitution in 1946 in a, in a referendum, the uh, Australian Commonwealth Parliament has the power to make laws for the peace, order, and good government of the Commonwealth with respect to the provision of maternity allowances, widow's pensions, child endowment, unemployment, pharmaceutical, sickness and hospital benefits, medical and dental services, but not so as to authorize any form of civil conscription, as well as benefit to students and family allowances. Now, obviously, because that is a very detailed listing of what we might consider to be welfare matters that uh, over which the Australian Commonwealth Parliament can legislate on, those welfare matters that are not listed in subsection uh, 23A must, ne by necessary implication, belong to state parliaments exclusively, unless state parliaments then uh, relinquish to the uh, Australian Commonwealth Parliament the power to legislate over certain uh, welfare subjects or matters. So hence, in general, the Commonwealth Parliament has no power over, su over such subject matters as education, welfare, health, the environment, the exercise of professions, mining, forestry, local governments, farming, agriculture, sole traders and partnerships, and employment and employment relations. Now, so we've talked so far of um, three types of uh, powers using this framework here. So first, number one relates to the powers which belong exclusively to the Australian Commonwealth Parliament. The other uh, set of legislative powers would belong exclusively to the state parliaments, and that's represented by number three. And then in the middle, 
which is represented by number two, would be the, the uh, subjects over which both the Commonwealth Parliament and the state parliaments can legislate concurrently, subject to the rule, as I mentioned, that the moment that the uh, Commonwealth Parliament has legislated on a subject which it would have shared concurrently with the states, and the Commonwealth Parliament has has evinced a desire or intention to cover that field exclusively and completely, then in that case, state parliaments can no longer legislate on that field. Uh, more importantly, even if both the state law, even both, even if both the state parliaments and the Commonwealth parliaments can uh, legislate on the same subject matter, and especially in the instance when the Commonwealth Parliament has not indicated its intention to cover that field uh, exclusively and completely. Still, if there is an inconsistency between the Commonwealth law and the state law, then it will be the Commonwealth law that will prevail. And the state law, to the extent of the inconsistency, will be considered invalid. Now, in that uh, figure or in that illustration, number four, there are certain uh, fields or subjects over which both the Commonwealth Parliament and the state parliaments cannot legislate on. And that is uh, what we will dis be discussing now. So these are the denied powers. So powers which are denied to both the Commonwealth Parliament and state parliaments. Examples would be um, both the Commonwealth Parliament and state parliaments are prohibited against impairing interstate trade, commerce, and intercourse. So the Constitution guarantees that interstate trade, commerce, and intercourse must always be free. So if there is any law that impairs the, the trade and the commerce or the intercourse across states or interstate, that law would be invalid or unconstitutional. So not even the Commonwealth Parliament can pass a, legis a law or legislation that would restrict the freedom of uh, interstate trade, commerce, and intercourse. There's also a prohibition against impairing the implied freedom of political communication. And we will be exploring this later on. So constraints on uh, the, the power of uh, can, uh, electoral candidates or even newscasters or broadcasters to speak on uh, certain matters involving uh, the Australian politics or involving Australian government. Neither the Commonwealth Parliament nor the state parliaments can uh, impose, can, can impair uh, the power of uh, implied freedom of political communication. This is considered an implied freedom because that specific freedom is not found in the Australian Constitution. But the High Court uh, has deemed it that there is an implied freedom uh, of political communication because that is the only way that, um, that the Australian polity or the Australian government can be deemed to function uh, subject to the rule of law because the, the freedom of political communication will limit potential excesses of uh, Australian governments uh, and uh, limit as well uh, their, uh, their attempts to perhaps uh, perpetrate abuses on the people. The other uh, denied power, or a power that is denied both to the Commonwealth Parliament and state parliaments would be the prohibition against impairing the institutional integrity of state courts. And what this essentially means is that um, it is not permissible, for example, for state courts to, so even if, even if as we mentioned before, state supreme courts are actually creations of uh, the Australian states, and therefore their creations because they are based on laws that were passed by the uh, Australian states. And so therefore it is within the power of state parliaments to, to, to make amendments or change that law that may relate to the tenure of state uh, judges, or it may relate to the salaries of state, state judges. It may even be permissible for at the level of states to, uh, 
to vest non-judicial power in state Supreme Court judges because, as we said previously, there is no, uh, sub there is no separation of powers at the level of states. So whilst the state parliaments, for example, may uh, pass law that would make changes and amendments to the, uh, the way that state courts operate, the rule is that any law that they pass must not impair the institutional integrity of state courts. So there are at least two aspects to this. One is that we must remember that state Supreme Courts, for example, are actually part of the uh, Australian federal judicature under the autochthonous doctrine. So even if state Supreme Courts, for example, belong to the states, still they are considered to be an integral part of the federal judicature. And for that reason, it would not be permissible for state parliaments to pass legislation that would bring into disrepute or question the integrity of state courts. So if state Supreme Courts, for example, become instruments for uh, the state parliaments uh, in the sense that uh, they become just the, the tools of the, of the state parliaments to do the bidding of the state parliament. So, for example, the state parliament may pass a law uh, that would then uh, provide that uh, state Supreme Court judges uh, must, upon the, upon the instance of state parliaments, for example, incarcerate a certain person without uh, a power, its power to change what the, uh, the state parliament says, that will be uh, deemed to be an impairment of the institutional integrity of state courts because that, in that case, the state courts then becomes just an instrument or a tool of, uh, to serve the interests of state parliaments, and that is not permitted. Uh, the the uh, second aspect of this is that the, because the state courts are considered to be uh, the to be part of the federal judicature, it is essential that even at the level of states, there must always be a court that can be the, the forum for appeals from all other uh, courts within a state. So it is not permissible, therefore, for example, for uh, state parliaments to abolish state supreme courts because the state supreme courts are the, uh, the repository of powers to review appeals from the lower courts within a state. Now, the fourth limitation on uh, both the Commonwealth Parliament and state parliaments, as far as uh, the power to legislate on a field, would, would uh, come from the Boilermakers Doctrine. And we will recall that under the Boilermakers Doctrine, the High Court ruled that uh, it is not permissible for the Australian Commonwealth Parliament so it's the Commonwealth Parliament or the Federal Parliament, it is not permissible for the Australian Federal Parliament to pass a law whereby um, judicial power is vested in a non-Chapter 3 court. So under the Boilermakers Doctrine, uh, judicial power can only be exercised by Chapter 3 courts or courts that have been constitution, constituted under uh, Chapter 3 of the Constitution, constitution and so therefore it would be impermissible or unconstitutional for the Australian Commonwealth Parliament to uh, vest judicial power in non-Chapter 3 courts. The second aspect to the Boilermakers Doctrine is that it is impermissible for the uh, Australian Commonwealth Parliament to vest non-judicial power in uh, Chapter 3 courts or judges, subject to the persona designated doctrine, which I'm sure you're already very familiar with. So again, the, the Boilermakers Doctrine is not an extra statement uh, of the Australian Constitution. However, it is implied that because of the partial, su partial separation of powers in the uh, framework of the Australian Constitution, it is implied that there is this uh, limitation on the power of the Commonwealth Parliament to legislate. And so that's, that's uh, shown by the Boilermakers Doctrine. So keep this in mind that the uh, High Court has in at least four instances, not really four, but three instances, 
uh, about uh, the prohibition against impairing the implied freedom of political communication. Secondly, prohibition against impairing the institutional integrity of state courts and uh, the, the, the prohibitions based on the Boilermakers Doctrine. In these instances, the High Court has made implied uh, rules denying both the Commonwealth Parliament and the state parliaments to legislate on certain fields. So it, is, it was an implied interpretation of the Australian Constitution. Now keep that in mind because we're heading towards a discussion of the boiler of the engineers case, where instead of uh, folk basing their decision on implied the implied interpretation of the Australian Constitution, they they focused on a literal interpretation of the Australian Constitution, and that has a different effect altogether. What we call the expansionary consequences of the of the engineers case, which we will see uh, in a short while. So, focusing now on the uh, engineer's case. So, uh, previously, as we said, the High Court made implied assumptions and implied uh, principles uh, concerning the Australian Constitution. And initially, the High Court also made cert uh, also had implied. Uh, also assumed that there were, imp there were implied assumptions based on the Australian Constitution. And this related, for example, to implied immunity. So in the case, for example, of uh, Demden versus uh, Petter, the High Court ruled that uh, it was not permissible for a state law to require Commonwealth public servants to affix a stamp duty on receipts that would acknowledge uh, their salary payments. So the High Court ruled that uh, this kind of state law uh, impaired uh, the, the, the operations of the uh, Commonwealth, uh, Commonwealth government. And because of the implied immunity of the Commonwealth from the operation of state laws, then that law passed by uh, a state was deemed to be unconstitutional. So it was an implied immunity because it is not expressly provided in the Constitution. In another case, in the case of Federated Amalgamated Government Railway and Tramway Service Association versus New South Wales Traffic Employees Association, in this particular instance, the uh, what the Commonwealth did uh, was then to pass a law which said that the Commonwealth Arbitration Court could uh, have jurisdiction over disputes between states and their employees. So the Commonwealth Parliament passed a law with, uh, whereby the Commonwealth Arbitration Court had the jurisdiction to uh, decide matters involving disputes between states and their employees. But again, the uh, High Court struck down that uh, Commonwealth legislation as being unconstitutional because of the implied immunities of uh, the states and their instrumentalities from uh, Commonwealth legislation. So in other words, that uh, because of the implied immunities doctrine, the High Court understood that it was not permissible for the Australian Commonwealth Parliament to legislate on matters that related to the operations of states. So the Australian Commonwealth Parliament could, let, could not legislate uh, on the uh, key officers, for example, of, uh, of the states. So that is based on an implied uh, immunity doctrine. These things, however, changed. Uh, in the case of uh, Amalgamated Society of Engineers versus Adelaide Steamship Company Limited or the engineer's case. So the engineer's case is again one of the key cases you need to remember. So one of the key cases you, you would have become very familiar with by now would be the Boilermakers case. But the other uh, very crucial uh, case in constitutional law, which you need to uh, always remember is the engineer's case. Um, in, this, in this particular case, uh, what had happened was that the Amalgamated Society of Engineers, which was a trade union who, which had members uh, throughout Australia, they had served a log of claims 
on various employers throughout Australia claiming that um, there was a need for improved wages and, condition, and conditions of employment for their union members. And, uh, one, and uh, some of the uh, employees in this instance were actually instrumentalities of, uh, of, of states. And because the employers did not agree or concede to the claims, the union, the union then began proceedings in the uh, Commonwealth Arbitration Court against the uh, various employers, and they sought a resolution of the industrial dispute between the union and the employers, including um, the employers which actually happened to be uh, instrumentalities of the states, such as the uh, West Australian Minister for Trading Concerns, the West Australian State Implement and Engineering Works, as well as the West Australian State Sawmills. So, on the basis of the implied doc impunities doctrine that had previously been articulated by the High Court in Federated Amalgamated Government Railway and uh, Tramway Service Association versus New South Wales Traffic Employees Association, as well as, well as the case of the Emden versus Pedder, the um, these West, uh, Western Australian state instrumentalities uh, sought to uh, have the, the uh, suit filed by the Amalgamated Society of Engineers uh, dismissed because to them, uh, they said that the, uh, the law which created the Commonwealth uh, Arbitration Court could not reach out to settle disputes that involved uh, states or state instrumental instrumentalities. So they again raised the uh, implied immunities doctrine. However, uh, in, this, in the case of the engineers, in, in the engineer's case, the High Court ruled, make, the High Court made a literal interpretation of the Constitution. So what they did was to, was to uh, examine the Australian Constitution if in fact there was any express if there, was an, if there was any provision in the Australian Commonwealth Constitution that in fact expressly provided for immunities of uh, state instrumentalities or the state governments from laws passed by the Commonwealth Parliament. So the, the, the High Court sought to search for express provisions in the Australian Commonwealth Constitution. However, the uh, High Court could not find any uh, express provision. So the effect was that uh, the, the, uh, the, the High Court therefore sanctioned the expansion of Commonwealth legislative powers for as long as it is within the general scope of the affirmative words which give the power and if it violates no express condition or restriction by which that power is limited. So what the High Court then said is that for as long as the, the, uh, it was within the power of the Australian Commonwealth Parliament to legislate on, for example, under Section 51, and under Section 51, uh, it was within the power of the, uh, of the Australian Commonwealth Parliament to legislate per, uh, on industrial disputes which went beyond the limits of any one state. And for that reason, it was within the competence, therefore, of the Australian Commonwealth Parliament to legislate on that. And if by legislating on that specific field, it also affected and touched upon uh, states, state governments, and state in instrumentalities, that the fact that the, uh, that specific Commonwealth legislation affected or reached out to uh, the operations of state governments or their instrumentalities, would not make that law unconstitutional because it was within power under Section 51 of the uh, Australian Constitution. So as Isaac, uh, as the High Court uh, said, states and persons natural or artificial representing states when parties to industrial disputes in fact are subject to Commonwealth legislation, under uh, subsection 35 of section 51 of the Constitution. 
And um, according to the High Court as well, the grant of legislative power to the Commonwealth is under the doctrine of Hajj versus the Queen. And within the prescribed limits of area and subject matter, the grant of an authority as plenary and as ample as the imperial parliament in the plenitude of its power possessed and could bestow. So in this specific case, the High Court made a literal interpretation of the Australian constitution. But the, the, what that had as an effect was that because of the uh, literal interpretation of, is that the same slide that we're having? Hold on. Seems to be. Now, what the effect was that because of the uh, literal interpretation of the High Court, the net effect was that the High Court was unwilling to, uh, to read any implied limitation on the power of the uh, Australian Commonwealth Parliament to legislate on a subject over which it had been given power by, section, by the Constitution, for example, specifically by Section 51, to legislate on. As pointed out by the High Court, for as long as uh, the power was granted to it by the Constitution, then that power was plenary, was plenary, was complete, and as ample as the Imperial Parliament in the plenitude of its power possessed and could bestow. So the High Court would not... Uh, would not consider any implied limitation on that power if that power had been granted to the Australian Commonwealth Parliament. But the, the significance of this was that because of the literal interpretation of the Constitution, if the Australian Parliament therefore passed legislation uh, over which it could uh, legislate, so for example, if the Australian uh, Commonwealth Parliament passed legislation, concerning uh, trade and commerce with other countries and among the states under uh, subsection 1 of section 51. If within that same law, it then passed legislation concerning education or concerning the environment, even if the environment and uh, education would be subjects or fields that would have belonged exclusively to the states. The fact that the Australian Commonwealth Parliament has the power to legislate on trade and commerce, uh, has, has, the fact that the Australian uh, Commonwealth Parliament has the power to legislate on trade and commerce with other countries and among the states under subsection one of section 51, the fact alone that that specific legislation which, which it uh, passed, the fact alone that it contained a subject or field over which, over which it originally did not have power to legislate on would not detract from the validity or constitutionality of that law. As uh, the High Court stated in Actors and Announcers Equity Association versus Fontana Films Proprietary Limited, uh, Justice Stephen said, if a law enacted by the federal legislature can be fairly described both as a law with respect to grant of power to it and a law with respect to a matter or matters left to the states, that will suffice to support its validity as a law of the Commonwealth. According to his honor, constitutional validity did not require that the law relate to a subject within Commonwealth legislative power by virtue of its predominant character. So, just to, just to emphasize, for as long as the Australian, so let's assume that the Australian Commonwealth Parliament passes a law. For as long as uh, that law passed by the Australian Commonwealth Parliament is on a subject or field that the Australian Constitution has given it power to legislate on, then it is permissible following the expansionary consequences of the engineer's case. It would then be permissible for the Australian Commonwealth Parliament to include in that same law a law that relates to other fields or subjects that would have exclusively belonged to the uh, Australian states. So, for example, um, let's say under Section 51, subsection uh, 10, on uh, the power of the Australian Commonwealth Parliament to pass legislation concerning fisheries in Austra on Australian waters beyond territorial limits. If the uh, Australian Commonwealth Parliament passed a law on that, on that subject, and in that same law, 
it then passed legislation concerning the environment or concerning uh, education or concerning welfare, the fact that there are other subjects or fields which did not really pertain to fisheries, the fact that, and that those fields or subjects actually would have been fields or subjects over which the state parliaments had exclusive competence to legislate on, that would not detract from the validity or constitutionality of the law. It was not even necessary, according to the Actors and Announcers Equity Association, that the, that specific law was predominantly over a field or subject that was within the uh, competence of the Australian Commonwealth Parliament to legislate on. So even if, even if um, the predominant character of the law pertained to subjects or fields that belonged exclusively to state parliaments, for as long as that same law had a subject or field over which the Australian Commonwealth Parliament could legislate on, that would provide for uh, the validity and constitutionality of that specific Australian Commonwealth legislation. So, because of the uh, expansive and expansionary doctrine of the engineer's case, the High Court uh, ruled that it was permissible for the Commonwealth to regulate waterside employment under the power of the Commonwealth to legislate with respect to trade and commerce with other countries. So waterside employment relates to employment within the within with within the Australian uh, Commonwealth itself and yet and yet because the law passed then uh, by the Australian Commonwealth Parliament related to trade and commerce with other countries and in that same legislation they also sought to regulate waterside employment then uh, that legislation was deemed valid even if it would have originally been outside of the competence of the Australian Commonwealth Parliament to legislate on so even the promotion of conservation goals or the control of superannuation fund investments, uh, the regulation of intrastate trade, or the enforcement of a training guarantee scheme on employers, the, or these were uh, instances where, in a sense, the Australian Commonwealth Parliament overreached. It went beyond uh, the fields or subjects that had uh, over which the Australian Commonwealth had uh, Australian Constitution had given it power to legislate on. So even if there was an overreach by the Australian Commonwealth Parliament, these instances of overreach, or even when they legislated beyond uh, fields or subjects which over which it was permitted to legislate on, it was these instances were considered to be valid and constitutional because in passing these legislation. The, uh, the Australian Commonwealth Parliament actually also legislated on a subject over which it had competence to legislate on. And the net effect and, uh, of this is that uh, Chief Justice Latham in Bank of New South Wales versus Commonwealth or the bank nationalization case uh, felt that as a consequence of the expansionary doctrine of the engineer's case, because of the power of the Commonwealth uh, Parliament to impose a tax, then it would be permissible for the Australian Commonwealth Parliament to pass a law on taxation and then, in that same legislation, pass a law, uh, in that same legislation, uh, also, uh, also include uh, subjects such as uh, conservation, or waterside employment, or welfare, or um, education, or environment, even if these would have been subjects that belonged exclusively to the states. So as he said, if all laws passed by the Commonwealth Parliament imposing taxes of any kind were held to be valid, then the taxation power alone would enable the Commonwealth to pass laws upon any subject, whatever, by imposing a tax upon specified acts and omissions. So what this effect effectively means is that the, taxing, the taxation power of the Commonwealth Parliament could be used to to uh, legislate on any field or subject, including those to, that would have belonged exclusively to the engineer's case. Now, the great danger of this kind of proposition was that it effectively weakened the power of state parliaments. So we will remember that um, the reason why the Australian Federation came into being 
was after there was a lot of negotiations among the various uh, officers of the Australian polity, and whereby the state governments and the state parliaments agreed to surrender some of their powers in favor of the Commonwealth Parliament. But there was the assumption that uh, the, the powers that the Australian Parliament did not concede or give up or relinquish to the Australian Commonwealth must, have, must continue to belong to them as states. But because of the doctrine of the engineer's case, the, the, the arrangement about powers of the states were in a sense dismantled in favor of the Commonwealth Parliament. So the, the, the engineer's case has actually been attacked and questioned by many commentators and even by the high court judges themselves because it seemed to be unsound. The literal interpretation given by the high court in the engineer's case of the constitution seemed to be unsound because it effectively dismantled uh, the, uh, the, the, the power arrangement of the Commonwealth to the, to the uh, disadvantage, to the great disadvantage of states whose uh, powers had suddenly then uh, become subject to the uh, control by the Commonwealth Parliament. However, it should be pointed out that notwithstanding um, any complaint or criticism against the engineer's case, it is still the law as of today. So just remember the uh, expansionary consequences of the engineer's case. So the, the, the rule there is simple. For as long as the Australian Commonwealth Parliament has the power to legislate on a specific subject, the fact that in that same law, it may then uh, include subjects or fields which would have exclusively belonged to the states would not detract from the validity or constitutionality of that same law. Even if the, uh, even if the predominant character of that law was actually in relation to a field or subject that would have ex exclusively belonged to the states. That law would still have remained valid for as long as it touched upon a field or subject over which the Australian Commonwealth Parliament had competence to legislate on. Now, however, the High Court uh, put, its foot, put its foot down in a sense. And uh, in that sense, therefore, it had, again, uh, set some implied assumptions on the power of the Australian Commonwealth Parliament to legislate. The High Court ruled in Melbourne versus Commonwealth of the state banking case that it would not permit, the Australian Commonwealth Constitution would not permit Commonwealth legislation that affected or interfered with state governmental functions or their continued existence or unduly discriminated against them. Again, note, that this implied limitation of the power of the Commonwealth Parliament to legislate on is not expressly found in the Australian Constitution. Now remember, in the engineer's case, the High Court made a literal reading of the Australian Constitution so that, so that the High Court was saying, if there is no express prohibition or express limitation of the Australian Commonwealth Parliament to legislate on, a, on, on that subject, if there is no such express limitation, then, it is within the Australian Commonwealth Parliament to legislate on it. But in the case of Melbourne versus Commonwealth, or the state banking case, the High Court again made an implied, uh, or, or read an implied limitation on the, common, on the power of the Commonwealth Parliament to legislate. And it said that any Commonwealth legislation that affected or interfered with state governmental functions or their continued existence, or unduly discriminated against them, that legislation would be invalid because it interfered with the operations of state governmental functions. So it's, again, that's an implied uh, limitation on the power of the Commonwealth Parliament to legislate. As uh, Justice Rich said in that case, there is no general implication in the framework of the Australian, of the Australian Commonwealth Constitution that the Commonwealth is restricted from exercising its defined constitutional powers to their fullest extent by a supposed reservation to the states of an undefined field of reserved powers beyond the scope of Commonwealth interference. But 
This is always subject to the provisions of the Commonwealth Constitution itself. That Constitution expressly provides for the continued existence of the states. Any action on the part of the Commonwealth in purported exercise of its constitutional powers, which would prevent the state from continuing to exist and function as such, it is necessarily invalid because it is inconsistent with the express provisions of the Constitution, and it is to be noted that all the powers conferred by Section 51 are conferred subject to this Constitution. Now, I said earlier that this is an implied, I, I, I read this as, I, I read this case as an implied uh, limitation of the Commonwealth legislation because there is a difference between the continued existence of a state versus interfering with its existence. In other words, it is possible for a, when you think about it, it is possible for uh, the Australian Commonwealth Parliament to pass a law that would interfere with the function of, of a state government. But the mere fact that it interferes with the state functions does not mean that it will then have an effect on the existence of the states. What the Constitution provides for is the continued existence of the states. That is what the express provision of the Constitution is. The Constitution does not specifically or expressly provide for, a, for the prohibition against a Commonwealth parliamentary legislation that interfered with the existence of the states. So in other words, the Australian Commonwealth Parliament could have uh, validly or constitutionally passed a law that interfered with uh, the, the functions of a state government for as long as it did not impair the existence of the state. However, uh, the High Court in Melbourne versus uh, Commonwealth, uh, looking at the express provisions of the Constitution, saying that uh, or guaranteeing the continued existence of the states, re read this to mean that even those Australian Commonwealth Parliament laws that interfered with state governmental functions would be invalid. So after studying this topic, I would have hoped that you would be, then be able to discuss and explain the scope and limits of Commonwealth and state legislative powers and the subject matters over which they can legislate exclusively and concurrently, discuss and explain the conflicts in resolution of Commonwealth and state parliamentary relations, discuss and explain the expansionary doctrine in the engineer's case and the constraints of Commonwealth legislative power in interfering with state governmental powers, and cite and discuss key judicial decisions that elucidate the Commonwealth state legislative relations.